So I think you can trust me. So I think you can trust me. When a leader of another country can come to your country and dictate policy that will undermine the people of that nation, and yet to make it worse, the people of that nation will cheer for the conqueror. The state of Israeli arrogance is derived from the power of its supporters deeply embedded in the evangelical number one, entertainment number two, political number three, military number four, and last but certainly not least, its financial power structures in the United States. Israel, by its own admission, controls the United States. They have an entire spider web of political organizations, government officials, propaganda mills, media moguls, talking heads, shields, billionaires, millionaires, and more importantly, they control commerce. And the people in this nation, many of them, their allegiances to the state of Israel and not, not the United States and certainly not to the Father in Jesus Christ, not at all. The churches, Hollywood, and the internet are designed through artificial intelligence to cater to every desire of the state of Israel while blocking out any kind of truth or to deflect any kind of criticism. Now, I'm going to say just a word about Benjamin Netanyahu and then something that happened to me 10, 12 years ago. Benjamin Netanyahu can sneer. He can be arrogant, brazen, with a crooked smile because after decades, Israeli domination of the United States is complete. And when Netanyahu or any leader from Israel comes to the United States, they know that they don't come as an outside power. They come as an inside power that has conquered the United States. But the question is why? How does evil really work? About 10 years ago, maybe longer, I heard the former prime minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, say that he will chop up America piece by piece and turn it into the biggest welfare state in the world. He also said that America can dry up like dog shit and blow away. This is what he said almost verbatim. I remember it like it was yesterday because of what it did to me and my life at that time. However, it's what he said after that that would be a huge part of my life and the changes in me and being called to understand the truth that can only come from the Most High Father. So I urge you to get comfortable, get some water, relax, and listen to the truth that we're going to share here today. I want you to look at these people right here on the screen. They're all white. They're not my brothers. They're not my sisters. They're not my family. Okay. Now, see, I, I really got a real problem with this nonsense that I see on BitChute, this, this white racial, we're all one big white racial family. You boys, you Nazi people, you Hitler people, man, and you white, you know, that we're all one big family. You guys are some of the dumbest people going, man. You don't know God's truth. You don't know the Father. You don't know Jesus Christ. In fact, you know not a zilch, nothing. Their cupboards are bare. The elevator ain't going to the top floor. You're stuck in the basement, man. Not all white people are my family. When I defend white people, I'm defending God's white people, not all white people by far. Sometimes in life, we start to get it. We begin to understand, and that's what life is. It's moments, and then you start to have the bigger moments when your life starts to change because of those moments, and you never look back. This video and this teaching has the potential to be one of those moments. It has the potential to be one of those moments, if you will, listen and open up your mind, your heart, and your spirit, and try to understand what I'm showing you here today. I preach a lot about the lies told daily in this world, lies about everything, especially God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Scriptures, fallen angels, things that are talked about, but nobody really wants to talk about the truth. Moreover, one of the grossest lies taught in this world is that we are all the same. 
Now, any free-thinking person can clearly tell that we're not all the same. We don't look the same, we don't talk the same, we don't walk the same, and we don't behave the same. Let us un underscore we don't behave the same. We do not share the same beliefs, values, cultures, history, and most importantly, above all, we do not worship the same creator. Okay? We just don't. We don't worship the same creator. Clearly, then, we're not all the same. Now, we are told that we are all one big family and that love will cure the evil of this world. We are told to love evil people and their evil behavior. We are told to live in a world where one size fits all of a new age love fest. Now, this lie is pushed in schools, media outlets, Hollywood, TV, and churches. Now, as I told you earlier, I heard Benjamin Netanyahu say that he would chop up America piece by piece, turn it into the biggest welfare state. America could dry up like dog shit and blow away. It's what he said after that, though, that I want to tell you about, and I want you to understand, because we're going to talk about fallen angels, we're going to talk about evil, and I want to talk to you about this comment, because it was a struggle for me to, understood, to understand as I went further. And as I started to grow, this comment and what I was understanding caused me pain. It caused me anger. It caused me issues with my creator. And it was something that I had to accept. And it was a battle. All right? It was a real battle. But through, through Jesus Christ, man, all things are possible. But it opened my eyes to the truth. So after I heard Benjamin Netanyahu said that he would chop up America piece by piece, turn it into the biggest welfare state in the world, and that America could dry up like dog shit and blow away, it's what he said after that. And here's what he said, and I quote, God will let us do it. I mean, that just blew me away. And I thought, there's no way he means that my God, my father, who's he talking about? Because I knew what this man was. Now, the delusional supporters of the state of Israel will immediately think he's referring to his people being chosen. And if we do not do everything they say, God will curse us. That's not even close. What this evil being was saying was this. Now, pay close attention to this wisdom from God Almighty. What Benjamin Netanyahu was telling you is this. He and his workers are of the family of the devil. They know and have always known they can only do what our father allows them. Let us underline our father, for our father is not their father. See Genesis 3, 14 through 15, John 8, 44, and Matthew 13, 24 through 43. Benjamin Netanyahu was saying, we will ruin your nation. Benjamin Netanyahu was saying that our father and our God, whose name is Jehovah, not Yahweh. And if you don't know the difference between Jehovah, the real God of the Bible, Isaiah 26, 4, you get your everlasting strength from Jehovah. Or if you don't understand who the Yahweh is, the Babylonian name for the devil. Okay. Now, what he's saying is, is that your God, the real true God, will allow us to, us to do it because your nation is godless and it worships the devil just as we do. This is what Benjamin Netanyahu was telling the people. You see, children of the devil knows it's God who allows evil to thrive. Even in the scriptures, the, the evil spirits knew, folks, that they could only do. When they were confronted by Jesus Christ, they submitted to him. They fell down in, in fear. They didn't buck up to him. God Almighty gives permission to punish and destroy. Benjamin Netanyahu was a child of the devil, the literal offspring. And he is telling the naive masters to score right to their faces, and they still do not get it. Our father allows the synagogue of Satan to destroy our nations. The idea of a devil is nonsense and superstition to most people. The idea of the devil having children is fantasy to most people, but yet this is a biblical fact, which means the Bible is what? God's perfect word. In fact, churches deliberately shun this fact because of the ramifications of what doors this would open if it were true. You see, even the idea of an all-knowing almighty God is rejected. How about God hating certain people? We've been told since we were little how God and Jesus loves everybody the same. We're told that if you just accept Jesus, all is forgiven and you will make it. In fact, Jesus does say this. However, like so much of scripture, 
people take it out of context and they make it mean what makes them feel good. By doing this, they make themselves their own God. God said he hated Esau, but Jacob he loved. These were the brothers. These were the twins that fought in the womb. Now, most of you know this, but why did God say he hated Esau? What would make God say such a thing? Why did God say to kill them all? Yes, and, the, yes, and your, your father actually said to completely eradicate and destroy certain peoples. Why? Why? The subjects of the devil, the family of the devil, fallen angels, angels, evil spirits, witches, and more comes from the scriptures, the holy word. The great promises that we live by come from the Bible. I don't think they're true. I know they're true. However, the liar and cons know these words and subjects originate in, in the Holy Word, yet they do not use the word of our Father to teach these truths on these subjects. Why? They ignore the Bible, okay, and tell lies because they know the masses love the lie and reject the truth. They want to entertain and amuse the people. I don't do that. So if you're looking to be amused and entertained, you should leave now. I'm giving you God's truth, man, to help you to go further as you finish your life. And hopefully we can do it the right way, pleasing our Father, because things are getting harder. If you wish to understand this world and your place in it, you must have some understanding of God's word. If you truly want to learn about fallen angels, evil angels, spirits, evil spirits, witches, wizards, the last days, and more, you got to go to the scriptures and open it up. Now, there's no such thing as an expert. I'm hardly one. In fact, I know just a little bit, just a very little bit. I don't claim to know a lot, but what I do know, I know my father has said, here, this is yours. That's all I need, man. If God wants me to know more, he'll give it to me. Matthew 15, 3, Jesus Christ says this, but he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. That's the words of Jesus Christ. Luke 3, 9 says, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. And this is John the Baptist speaking here. The axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is honed down and cast into the fire. Now here, John is saying these trees, which in the Bible are symbolic of nations and people. John says they are chopped down and thrown in to the fire. This doesn't seem very inclusive and one love as the synagogue of Satan preaches does it. No, it's very exclusive. Yes, God is loving, very loving. And he can call anybody he chooses. Man, it doesn't matter. He could take a rock. He can take a, he can take a tree. He can take anything he wants and make it his child. Okay, there's, there's no limits on God. But God has and always has been exclusive to his family and whom he calls. All right. Now, let's get back to the Almighty Father telling his children to destroy people. I'm talking about their animals, their children, their women. And in, and in certain people, he tells them, you don't have to kill them all. You can even take their little ones and their, and their women as captives. This is heavy. This is a lot of people don't like the Old Testament because they look at the Old Testament. That's that mean old God of the Old Testament. Or they'll even call our father the devil. And Deuteronomy chapter 7 and 20, and you'll understand why God says to get rid of them all. Let me ask you something. We look at babies, and I do too. I love babies, animals. We look at a baby. He's beautiful. He's special. And there's nothing like seeing a little five-month-old baby with that little beautiful ball head. And you hold them, and they're so precious and innocent. God can see what the baby really is as to where we can't. God may look at that baby and say, that's not my baby. That baby, when it gets older, is going to be my enemy. He's going to be the enemy of my people. You see, we don't see that. God does. Now, let me show you why God says to get rid of them all. Now, I'm not going to read the entire chapter. You can do that on your own. I will tell you where it's at, and I will read two verses to you that will show you why your father said to destroy them all, and even the buildings that they dwell are contaminated. Deuteronomy 7.4. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. You see, what God is saying, God didn't plant these people. They are the enemies of the Father and you. They are the families of the devil. They deceive God's people and lead them to destruction. And then God will have to punish you and destroy you suddenly. What's happening now? The people are following who? the devil's family. 
Read the screen, please, and let's do it again. Deuteronomy 2018, that they teach you not to do after all their abominations, which they have done unto their gods, so should ye sin against the Lord your God. So God's telling you twice. Well, I want you to get rid of, and you can go and read this in its entire context on Deuteronomy chapter 7 and 20. God's telling his family, destroy all of them because they're going to turn you against me. Don't you understand? God comes first. God is telling you that's why he does it. Can evil simply do as it pleases? If so, all that we believe God has been is one big lie. If evil can prosper and God has no control, God's not God. Evil cannot prosper unless your father allows it. In the Gospel of Job, the devil had to have permission to touch Job, his family, and his possessions. Not a hair on your head can be hurt, and your hairs on your head are numbered unless God says so. Okay? The meaning, the spiritual meaning here is that God knows everything and God is everything. The devil, fallen angels, evil spirits, or anything can just not cannot walk about freely preying on God's children. This would make our Father irrelevant or even unfair and unjust. Many people join these families. They join evil then and now. They are given a choice. Now, the people that God said to destroy, the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, turn your attention to the screen. What color do you think these people were? Now, I've heard the ignorant people, they were black. They were brown. What about them being white? Ah, uh, what about them being white? What about them being white? Do you think their bloodlines have been eradicated? The seed of the devil is all over this earth, brethren. Right now, there are rapists, pedophiles, murderers, thieves, liars, and some of them are white. So forgive me. I don't have it in me with some of the emails I get and some of the texts and some of the nonsense and the comments about you shouldn't be talking about your white brothers and sisters. Listen to me, boy. Let me tell you something, boy. I, I, I only talk about white people that are not my brothers and sisters because not every white man, not every white woman or white child is my brother or sister. There are white men who abuse their children, beat their wives, beat animals, and worship the damn devil. They're my brother or sister. Get out of my face, boy. Now, what color are many of the people that scream they hate you and me for being white? They're white. Now, is this not 100% true? You're damn right it is. They are white just like us. The question is, are they Israelites? No, man, they're not. Are they of God? Not hardly. Yet, many white people will say that all white people are Israelites, the nonsense and the ignorance taught in Christian identity. Friends, let me say it again. The devil has a seat on this earth, and many of his children look like you and me. They have our hair color, our hair texture, because we as white people, we have certain features, we have certain eye colors, we look a certain way. I think we're beautiful people, incredibly pretty. Our women, I love them. We are, they are the most pretty. I love our men, except our men are not the same as they used to be. But not all of us, just because we look the same, were not planted by God. Do you understand? Because these people don't have a spirit of God. To be of God, you got to have a spirit. And you can't say that because you're white, God has given you a get-out-of-jail-free card because, oh, I'm white. I have no time for any stupidity in my life. To say that all white people are Israelites and we're all one white family is a lie from the bowels of hell, and I will not tolerate it. I've gotten rid of most of these stupid people. Our channel is actually shrinking because the people that are supposed to hear the message, they're there for a reason. These are people that God said destroy, all right? No mercy. God knows what's best for us. The problem is people fail to listen. In fact, in my experience, this is the meaning of life. Do we listen to our Father and obey Him, or do we disobey and follow the enemy? There's going to be consequences for following the enemy. If you fall in love with the Father and Jesus, you're going to listen. 
The book of Revelation speaks of one third of the angels. It calls them stars being cast out of heaven after a war in heaven and these, these rebel angels lost. They are cast out and it says, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth. You can find this in Revelation 12. We've taught it many times in our ministry. Now, earlier I asked you, why did God hate Esau and yet he loved Jacob? Why would God hate this man for God to hate? Because Esau took his seed that came from God and he sowed it in the children of the devil. All right. He took his seed that was, yes, what was Esau's color? White. What was Jacob's color? White. Like me. Like you. Esau sowed his seed with children of the devil. God hated him for it. In the book of Genesis chapter 6, in the time of Noah, Noah also speaks we, we, we learn about the giants in the earth in those days, and Noah was found perfect in his generation. Why? Because Noah, in his blood, had no outside blood. He had not fornicated with the seed of the damn devil. He was of the bloodline of Adam and Eve and nothing else. This is the family of God Almighty. Now, however, I have a question for the ambulance chasers that make the videos and spread the lies about giants. So let me get into the fallen ones. Let me ask the question, and you ask this to anybody who makes the videos to these fools. How did the alleged 25, 50, 75 foot, 100 giant, 100 foot giants procreate with little five foot women? Come on now. How did they procreate with them? How would a little bitty woman Five foot, procreate with the 50 foot giant. Let me ask you something else. Did the women have a choice? Remember, some of these women were the daughters of God. Maybe not all, but some of them certainly were. There were giants in the Bible. However, nowhere, nowhere near like the liars tell the naive people. Your ancestors fought, fought the giants, and on one occasion, they sent spies to see the giants. The spies returned and said, we were as grasshoppers to them. Does this mean the giants were 50 to 75 foot tall, or does it mean they were so much bigger than the average man was of that day and even today that your ancestors were like, man, we're really small. We're really small to these people. That's what it means, folks. It doesn't mean they were 100 feet tall. But yet the question to all the liars, how does a giant, with the people that believe this, that are 50 and 75 foot tall, and weighs, what, thousands of pounds? How would he procreate with a little woman? And most of the women back then were small, tiny. Even if they were big women, it wouldn't matter. The Bible speaks of these beings ranging from 7 to 12 foot, which is huge, man. I mean, if you were to see a 7-foot basketball player, and I have in person at the University of Virginia, I've seen some big guys. It's big, all right? It's big. Does that mean... Is that the same as somebody being 40, 50, 75 foot tall? Not even close, man. You're talking about something that would be six, seven, eight stories tall, procreating with a little bitty five foot woman. This is the nonsense and BS that is taught in National Geographic, YouTube, BitChute, magazine covers, websites, movies, and more. These are also the same people that push the UFO agenda. You see, you start to see that God's word is being corrupted not in its actual, uh, on paper, it's being corrupted with what, how it's taught. David killed Goliath, who was a giant. David killed him because of his faith in his father. Hear me. David killed Goliath, this Philistine, because of his faith and trust in who? His father. David did not kill that 12-foot man on his own. That man may have been 12 feet, 800, 1,000 pounds, maybe more. David did not kill this man with his slingshot because he was the toughest guy going. He did it because of his father. Do you not see what's going on here? Our ancestors fought these beings in battle. How did they win? Because they trusted in their father. The masses believe such fantasy as Russian troops just shot and captured giants in the mountains of Russia. Yes, a brother actually sent this to me three years ago. I was ashamed of it. And it's being covered up, he said, by the governments. Poof, we man, come on, man. Uh, people believe these things, man. Do I believe in Sasquatch or Bigfoot? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And if many of you are wondering, well, you've never said that, it's not important to me. But do I believe? I do believe there are some left over from that time. 
I don't think they're as big, anywhere near as big as what people think they are. All right? I just don't. Okay? Now, what was the purpose of these beams? And whose adversary were these beams? Ours. And what was the purpose of them? When we fight them and when we won, who got the praise? Our Father. What did it teach us? That you can't win without your Father. How did we defeat them when they were bigger and had more than we had? We won then and now through our Father in no other way. And no other way. Period. Our Father had us fight these and other beings. Some were large and dangerous. However, if loyal and faithful to our Father, we will be victorious. Again, we see the great Father teaching his children, how do you make it? Through me, he says. Through me. Through me, you can do anything. What's happened in society, the masses actually look at giants, fallen angels, devils, aliens, who are nothing more than demons, gangsters, killers, low lives, pieces of shit, as special cool, and they desire to be a part of them. For example, there are people that make gangster videos now about how is a man a gangster if you take a gun, put it up to another man's back of his head, blow his brains out, how is that a gangster? If you're really a badass, how about you and I both pull guns on one another, and then we find out who's the real G, as they call it. When you got to look at death in the eye and find out is it going to shrink or are you going to be a man? Then you find out how much G that you have in you. We are not to marry, nor were we to marry or fornicate with these people in any manner. Yet the masses then and now will have always gravitated toward evil while denying our Father. Then they moan and complain about how bad life is. Yet the word that we have to look at again is choices. Choices. Speaking more of corrupt bloodlines, if we go to Genesis 3, we see the first corrupt bloodline when the serpent, a.k.a. the devil, had sex with Eve. I believe that he did. I believe there was something really what we would call today. It's, I don't even want to talk about it, but there was something going on between those three. Uh, maybe we can get into it in great detail in one day, but let me tell you what God did say. God himself said that he would put hatred between two, two families, and indeed he has. Remember, God said in Genesis 3 and 14, he looked at the devil and said, I will put hatred between your family and my family. You see the line being drawn here. Now, let me ask you something else. Do you think the serpent in the Garden of Eden was a talking snake? Many do. Logically, he had to become a man, and this was the devil himself. Another question, did he have the authority to do this without God's permission? Many will say yes, and many are in churches and roaming the internet looking for naive victims to believe their lies. Remember, he had to have permission just to touch Job. The Bible calls the devil the tempter. Get it? Tempter. Now let's think about something vitally important to our understanding of how this works and how it is the key to our last day's walk. <clears throat> Pardon me. In Genesis 3, we're told that Eve failed to do as she told. As she was told, God told her, don't touch. This is, this is what you have to do. He gave her instructions. She disobeyed. You see, God tells us what to do, and then we have the choice. We have the choice. Do you understand? In Psalm 78, 49, we read that in one of our previous videos how God sent evil angels among the people to punish them. However, he didn't punish everyone. He punished the people who were disobedient, moaning and complaining when he was feeding them with angels' food. Who sent the angels? God. Who had control of them? God. Did they just get up and go on their own? Not hardly, man. God wouldn't be God. Some people say they believe in God, but deny the devil, evil spirits, and the Bible. Some deny the devil altogether. Some believe the devil has power and the Father in heaven is in nonstop warfare trying to control this evil being and the evil people in this earth. Some believe God is a devil. Some don't believe any of it, but yet they believe in television, internet, Hollywood, the media, and any website that they land on when they roll the dice. So they reject the truth. But the question is, why do they reject the truth? Why did Jesus Christ speak in parables? 
He spoke in parables because he didn't want everybody to understand. Please turn your attention to the screen, please, and read with me the words of Jesus Christ. Matthew 13, 10 and 11. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? 11. Jesus answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. You see, it's not for everybody. People talk to spirits. They seek witches, wizards, and such to, such beings to get help, knowledge, and even friendship. Why don't they go to God and Jesus instead of going to evil? They don't believe in God. Or they've gone to God and he didn't answer them the right way, or he didn't answer quick enough, so they sought another avenue, and God let them go. The problem is, is that all other avenues lead to the devil. That leads to evil. Men and, and women in ancient times sought help from spirits. They want to talk to the dead, and we see it now. Again, it's a choice. There is a huge genre right now for ghosts, demons, talking to it, all this stuff, man, trying to communicate with the dead when the Bible says the dead know nothing. Now, I know some people believe that when you die, you go straight to heaven. If that's the case, why do we even have a resurrection? Why do we even have a, a resurrection if we go straight to heaven? Why would Jesus have to raise us up and judge us if we just get to bypass all that and just go on? The masses have no idea what the Father said about contacting and playing games with these evil spirits. God hold, told his children to avoid and reject familiar spirits, witches, wizards, necromancers, and all kinds of evil. All kinds. Of, we were told to avoid it. However, what is the word there? Choice. In the New Testament, the evil spirits which, which possessed people were terrified of Jesus. They fell at his feet and asked him not to harm them before the appointed time. These spirits knew of Jesus. They knew his name as Jesus, and they knew of his power. They called him the Son of God. Yes, yes, they called him the Son of God, and they called him by his name. I turn your attention to the screen, please, Matthew 8, verses 29. And behold, they, talking about the, the, the devils, cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to, tor to torment us before the time? They call him Jesus, the Son of God, and they acknowledge he's boss and he's coming for them. No games are being played. Notice what they call him, though. Jesus. Not Yahushua, not Yahweshua. This is why they try to take away the name Jesus because of the power that is in the name of Jesus, man. Philippians 2, 9. Please turn your attention to the screen, please. Philippians 2, 9 through 10. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. That at the name of what? Jesus. The name of, uh, above what? Every name. What is it, folks? Jesus. Surely God can spell <laughs> over, all over this world. They've started this campaign, and it's big. That God's name is not this. It's Yahweh. It's Yeshua. They're taking away the power and the name, man. And the lost people, they follow this lie. They follow it. And you want to know what? At one time, I believed it too. I'm not going to lie and act like that, that I was perfect because I was anything but. I'm not a hypocrite. I won't lie to you and I won't BS you. I believed it too. But not, not for a while now. When my father told me the truth. Luke 10, 17. And the 70 returned again with joy because there were 70 apostles and more, not just 12. It ended up being 12 special apostles, but at one time there were many apostles. And the 70 returned again with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. What name? Jesus. When it gets bad or when it's good, it's always what? Jesus. In the morning, Jesus at breakfast, Jesus at coffee, Jesus at lunch, Jesus at night, Jesus in everything, it's the name Jesus. James 2.19, thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So the devils know God's real. We got jackasses walking this earth that 
Heck, God's a myth. Jesus is a myth. It's a lie. The Bible's been corrupted. But the damn devils know. You poor dumb fools just don't know. The devils believe and are in great fear of God. Everything, if it has any sense or any kind of a spirit, would be in great fear of God. These devils are in fear of God, but yet they continue to do evil. wonder why. We're going to understand. God knows all about these beings since, since he is the boss of all. But many people believe that God is nothing more than an, than an absentee doctor at a mental hospital where the inmates have run wild. There's never been a second that God has not been in complete control. So we've gone to some deep waters today, and we're going to drop the anchor, and we're going to finish this teaching together. Now, if with what we're learning, we can have a little bit better understanding of this world and what's coming and why things are the way they are. It's the spirit, folks. You got to have a spirit of God in you, man. That's what makes you who you are. It's not your flesh. It's your, it's your spirit. Now, one of the most compelling and powerful parts of the Bible is when the spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted of, of the devil. And Jesus refuted him three times with what? The word of God. Now we have the, the war on the word of God, the war on the name of Jesus. You see, they're trying to take away the power. Jesus refuted the devil with what? God's word, God's promises. You understand? I want to read a passage that I find powerful, and it describes all of it. And I'm going to paraphrase because some struggle to understand it. Therefore, with the Father's help and blessing, I'm going to paraphrase because I want you to understand Romans 9, 21 through 23 says, Have not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? The Father has power over everything. He's the creator. He is the master potter. He has created some to be evil. This is dishonor. He has created some to be his. This is honor. 22. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. So we read that our Father is showing his wrath, his punishment with great patience, because long suffering means patience. By using these evil beings created evil that were fitted for destruction, it means they were created they were created to be destroyed. They are our enemy, adversary. And that's what the word Satan means, adversary. Twenty three and that he might make known the riches of his glory, and he's talking about you, he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, because he knew you before you came here. So 23, he's saying again, that through these evil people, he's going to show you his power, mercy, love, and glory for you, his children, that he had prepared this for you and prepared you before you ever came to this earth. Man, that's powerful. Proverbs 16, 4 says, The Lord hath made all things for himself. Yes, even the wicked for the day of evil. And a verse they hate to quote or even acknowledge is in Isaiah. In fact, I've had many people try to debunk this verse, but, but, but they cannot do it. They try because they have a perception of God. They choose not based on what God has revealed. Isaiah 45, 7, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. The deniers will say the word here, evil, means chaos. It doesn't matter. God is saying he can and has done it all. Does this mean that God is molesting children? No, man. God lets evil go and gives them a certain amount of leash. We have to look to God for help, all right? Now, shall we bring it home with this last bit of truth? We're going to read one of the most powerful exchanges in the entire Bible. And I want you to understand, here's a conversation between Jesus Christ and the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Pilate wants to, to save Jesus. He's afraid of Jesus. Uh, his wife had even came to him and told him, look, leave this man alone. Pay attention to this. John 19, 10 through 11. Then saith Pilate unto Jesus, you ain't going to speak to me? I'm paraphrasing. Don't you know that I have the power to crucify thee and I have the power to release thee? Jesus says this, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. 
So Jesus tells Pilate the power that he has, and this was a powerful man, comes from where? Above. Who's above? God the Father. Jesus tells Pilate, the Jews who brought me to you bear the burden. They bear the greater sin because they're going to murder me. How incredibly revealing is that? We are told the devil wanted to be like our father and he started a rebellion and a war in heaven among one third of, of the other angels. I don't know what all happened in heaven, all right? Uh, maybe the angels had free will just as we and they were allowed to make decisions of, of their own accord. However, are we really to believe that they were allowed to nudge each other in the elbow and say, hey, man, we're taking on God. Are you in? Pass it on. And God did not know about it. God didn't know about it. But all these beings got together, waged war in heaven, and God was like, wow, what's going on here? You see, power is taken away from God and given to evil. Now, if this evil being called the devil was created and then fell from heaven or rebelled in heaven without our father's, without our father's knowledge, attention, or in an independent act of his own will, would the inhabitants of heaven or earth ever be safe at any time if God could not control his own house? How could you ever have faith in your father if he couldn't handle his own creation? Well, God can handle it because God is the boss of all bosses. But people teach the lies because they want to take power away from God and they want to put it firmly in the lap of evil. You see the dark deceit of these people. Can you imagine the Almighty Father not knowing when any of his creations? Because Jesus Christ said in Matthew that when a sparrow hits the ground, your father knows about it. So do you really believe if anything in this world, heaven or earth, chose God knows everything? He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. Now, do you think there's anything that's ever been created that would, that would have the authority to become evil and usurp the authority of God. Now think about fallen angels, the garden of Eden, evil spirits. If you play out the fallacy of these monsters, then who's to say that the angels might not rebel again? Or maybe Jesus would go wild. I hate to say it, but it's the truth. And I know Jesus is like, go ahead, tell them the truth because it is the truth. Who's to say that Jesus might not get off the right hand of God and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to rebel today. This is the lies and bullshit that they teach because they want to take the power away from God and give it to evil as if the Father's pacing heaven saying, I don't know if I can control them. When God is the boss of all bosses and, his, and the one at his right hand is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the Father's right hand. He is the extension. He is the image. He's our King and our Savior. And he would never rebel. But you do see what they do by taking the power away from the Father. Maybe we would go through this whole life. And, and it would all be for naught because guess what? The beings decided to rebel against our Father again. And we had to do it all over again. This is the lies and horse manure that they teach. There's never been a millisecond when your father was not in total control to intervene, hinder, heal, kill, make a lie or anything he pleases. Okay? He can do anything he wants. Our father gave us his blood in Jesus Christ. His blood. Job 12.10. Please turn your attention to the screen, please, as we are getting ready to close. In whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? The goal of these evil beings is to make our father seem weak and even insignificant. This is why we have the great space lie. You see, they have created fictitious beings called aliens and spread the lies of life on other planets to make to reduce us and our father to being small, irrelevant, or non-existent about monsters from other planets. The question screams, what planets? <laughs> they are trying to reduce our father as being nothing. This is what they do. So, why did our Father create these beings? Let's go deeper, shall we? I want to tell you just a quick story as we close about the Pharaoh. The Egyptian Pharaoh, the Israelites, were in bondage in Egypt. The Pharaoh wanted no part of the, the Israelites or our Father. The Pharaoh knew they had the true and only Creator, and it scared the heck out of him. Now, hear me well. 
Your father made the Pharaoh rebel against him so he could show his children how incredibly powerful and loving he is and the love he has for his children, that when they do right by him, things are going to be okay. It is true. Your father gives evil much leash to work with, and it's true. It can be hard to deal with, hard to accept. It can cause you pain, anger, tears, frustration. I understand. We have to get over it. If we got to pray and pray and pray, and that's why we're always talking about prayer. We can never appreciate the good if it were not con contrasted with bad. Had we not, not known darkness, we would not appreciate the light. You got to be hungry to enjoy a good meal. You got to be thirsty to appreciate the water. Good and evil, pain and pleasure, light and darkness. We are learning that we cannot make it without our Father. Our Father is teaching you this. We are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We are important. We are what matters right next to our Father and Jesus Christ. The enemy wants to, you to think you are insignificant. God gave his blood for you in the form of his Son to atone for the, for the evil mistakes that, that we have committed in our, in our lives. I say that makes us really important. And I think that shows God's love and mercy. Come what will. You are going to endure, survive, thrive, and fight like hell and win. Or you will die the most glorious death that you can ever envision. You will die for God and you will join many people that came before you and you will take your place in the kingdom of the one true Father. And you will do it all in the name of Jesus Christ because the scripture says there ain't but one mediator between us and God, Jesus Christ. Thank you for watching. Amen.